For a while there, Baker Mayfield was seeming like a friend who had lost his way, telling you to come visit him in Carolina, only for you to get there and him to text you back that he actually moved to California. But hey, hit him up the next time you're in LA. And then when you do that, he tells you he's now in Tampa and thinks he could see himself there for the long term. You didn't believe him at first, and why should you? But then his job gave him a three-year, $100 million contract to stay in town, and suddenly it seems like our good friend Baker has found a real home. With the Bucks last season, Baker had his best year since his 2020 Browns run. The extra game helped Mayfield throw for the most yards and touchdowns of his career, all while posting the best completion rate for a season. And although we've talked about the limitations of passer rating on this channel, he posted his first ever perfect rating game on the road in Green Bay this past season, which is impressive regardless of what you think of that stat. But more important than anything else, he got back to the playoffs, and put the nail in the coffin of another collapsing team in the wildcard round. But in a journey that's been up and down since he entered the league, are we sure that Mayfield is actually back? Come here, you psychopath! One thing that's always popped out to me with Baker is just how much torque he can throw with. He's got one of the best bullet balls in the league, and it's a real weapon for him to fit into tight spaces. Here's an instance against Detroit in the divisional round where Mayfield shows off that arm strength. He'll target Jordan Palmer on the outside, who is running a curl route against a defender in zone coverage. As soon as the corner gives his own turn, his butt towards the sideline and his eyes pointed at the quarterback, Baker should know that his guy will get an opening when he puts on the brakes and the defense keeps backpedaling. Check out how early Baker decides to throw this ball. His hand is coming off to initiate the throw right as Palmer is stopping, and then he rips it low and away from the defender. The corner makes a great play to recover and still challenge the throw. Had this throw been a half second later, or just slightly weaker, there's a good chance this gets broken up. This is Baker at his best. Quick, simple decisions, throwing with confidence and power. With another year in Tampa, the hope is that they continue finding ways to let him play free and nurture that don't give a shit attitude that can make him lethal. But how good can Baker Mayfield be with the Bucks next year and beyond? Actually, wait. In the grand scheme of things, whether or not Baker Mayfield is good at football doesn't really matter. The stats, the film, who cares? You know what really matters? Experiencing things with the people who matter. And that's where today's sponsor, SeatGeek, comes in. With over 28 million downloads, SeatGeek is the number one rated ticketing app. It's been the one I've used in my personal life ever since I heard the B-Ball Breakdown channel shout it at me, and for good reason. There are more than 70,000 events on SeatGeek, including concerts, sports, festivals, and more. I actually recently moved back to the Cleveland area, and a few weeks ago, I used SeatGeek to go to a Guardians game. I'm not even a fan of baseball, but I'll never turn down an opportunity to sit in the sun with a drink. SeatGeek made it easy to get tickets to the game just a few days before the actual event without getting hit with any crazy prices. They put all the tickets across the web in one place to make sure you're getting a good deal. Each ticket is rated on a scale of 1 to 10 with a color-coded rating system, so look for the green dots. Green means good, red means bad, and every ticket is backed by their buyer guarantee. SeatGeek is the only site that lets you return your tickets ahead of the event with swaps. And starting today, you guys can use my code doesn't matter for $20 off your first purchase on SeatGeek. Again, that's code doesn't matter for $20 off your first tickets on SeatGeek. Thank you again to SeatGeek for being the first sponsor of this channel. Please consider them for your next event and use my code. Doing so indirectly helps my channel grow. Also, I lied about Baker being good or bad at football not mattering because it actually matters a lot, so back to the video. Back in Cleveland, Baker was often criticized for being a play-action quarterback, a game manager who fed off the Browns' good run game. In his best year with the Browns, Baker came in at a 28.9% play-action rate, which ranked 10th highest in the league. But in Tampa, Mayfield was forced to rely on more standard dropbacks. Last season, he threw in play-action concepts only 23.8% of the time, ranking 20th in the league. He also performed worse overall on these types of plays last year than he had in Cleveland, but I don't think the Florida weather suddenly made him worse at playing out of fakes. Instead, I think it had more to do with Tampa's run game being trash. The 2023 Bucks ranked dead last in yards per attempt while being 23rd in total attempts. 
Credit to them for sticking with it, but that sounds miserable. Compare this to the 2020 Browns, who were fifth in rushing yards per attempt with Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt in the backfield. I tell you, run the a stronger run game will naturally force defenses to react more to play action, and in turn, make the intermediate and deep shots easier to hit. Here's an example against the Texans in Week 9. The Bucks run play action to Rashad White and try to open up a crossing route to Godwin in the middle part of the field. Let's focus in on how the Houston linebackers react. To be fair, the middle linebacker takes an extra step inside before bailing out into coverage, but that right side one doesn't seem convinced at all. In fact, on his one step inside, he's leaning backwards and treats it almost as a way to power his backpedal into coverage. From the play design, it seems the play action was most focused on getting this defender out of the way to open up space for Godwin's route. Only, because he doesn't take the bait, this pass goes from easy pickup to difficult touch pass. And we can definitely criticize Baker on this throw. Not only could he have thrown a better ball to turn this into a completion, he also could have tried not staring it down the whole way. His eyes tell that right side linebacker where the ball is going and gives him time to get in front of it. But the point is that a stronger run game should take pressure off Baker and keep him in rhythm like it would any quarterback. Even still, Baker had a comeback year despite the Bucks' rushing attack. But after grading as the 29th best rush blocking team via PFF last year, Tampa Bay is making changes to its offensive line this upcoming season. Not only is Luke Gadecki entering the year as the established right tackle who improved rapidly at the back half of the season, but they've also brought in former Eagles Sua Apeta and giant Ben Bredson to shore up the guard rotation and drafted Duke's Graham Barton in the first round to replace center Robert Hainsley. Oh, and all-pro left tackle Tristan Wirfs is still on this line. Plus, the Bucks brought on a new offensive coordinator in Liam Cohen to replace David Canales, who went on to be the head coach in Carolina. The Bucks as a team were 18th overall in play-action pass attempts last year, but Cohen's Kentucky Wildcats were top 25 nationally in play-action percentage last year. I say there's good odds that he'll want to emphasize this part of Tampa's offense more than it was previously, which I think will really benefit Baker. Assuming, of course, that the run game is actually respected by defenses. Let's talk more about Cohen and what bringing him in will mean for Baker and the Bucks. This isn't Cohen's first time working with Baker. He was the OC for the Rams when Mayfield was in his brief but electric Los Angeles era. For Cohen, this stop was sandwiched between two years as the OC for Kentucky. While it's all just basically flirting at this point, the quotes coming out of Tampa between Cohen and his quarterback would have me excited if I were a Bucks fan. Any and every OC wants their QB to be confident, but Cohen in particular sounds like he wants to create an environment where Baker is empowered to play and lead in a way that's natural for him, saying, There is definitely a feeling that, that this is his team and, and it's okay to fail. It's okay. You know, go out there and let it rip and be yourself every single day, no matter what, because you're going to be the guy, and we believe in you. And, and I think that that's something that ultimately he just hasn't really had the opportunity to have all that often in his careers. In terms of actual scheme, Cohen comes from the Sean McVay coaching tree, which also includes the recently departed Dave Canales. While the offense should retain a lot of the elements from last year's, we can expect a few key updates based on what Cohen's liked to do in the past and what he said in interviews leading into training camp. First, there's the play action rate that we talked about earlier. We should see that increase by a healthy rate. And then Cohen has also emphasized a philosophy of players over plays. He won't shy away from forcing the issue and getting the ball to the team's best players. And I think this is a great mindset when you have wide receivers like Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. Both players received a hefty amount of targets, but Baker seemed to develop a special kind of chemistry with Evans. And why not? Evans might be one of the best but least talked about receivers in the league. While we all wondered where OBJ might play third receiver last year, Evans was quietly gearing up to make history as the first player to ever rack up 10 straight 1,000-yard seasons. Baker likes to play personnel ball like Cohen, especially with a guy he's called a first ballot Hall of Famer in Evans. Check out this play from the divisional round. Evans runs a go route here against a pressed cornerback. As long as the safety to his side doesn't move deeper to that side to contain him, this ball is going to Evans pretty much no matter what. 
Baker gets the snap, the safety rotates middle, and this ball is coming out while the corner is still in front of Evans. But check out the ball placement here. Baker hangs the ball up and over both guys, and Evans is able to sneak around and under the defender for the catch. These big plays are fantastic, but targeting your best personnel can also come in shorter yardage but high leverage situations. Here, on a third down against the Texans, Evans will again have a corner pressed up on him. But this time, he'll be running a slant to get him past the sticks for the first down. Evans gets free immediately, and based on Baker's drop back and instant decision, it seemed like this ball wasn't going anywhere else, regardless of what happened. While I'm not always the biggest advocate of just forcing the ball to your guys, football is a game of personnel as much as it is a game of inches. If you've got the better players at a position group, you've got to leverage that. I could see Evans getting an even heavier amount of targets this upcoming year. Cohen has mentioned wanting to use him similarly to how the Rams used Cooper Cup, saying, We had to be creative, whether it was by formation, alignment, where we would put him, or how we would end up in the final formation. Watch for the Bucks to use a lot more motion in their offense next year. In 23, the Bucks ranked 28th in pre-snap motion rate at 12.8%. Cohen's Wildcats were known for using a lot of motion to create confusion for the defense, and in his year with the Rams, they ranked third in motion rate at 31%. I wanted to highlight this play also in Houston because I think it will go differently next year. It's another third down, and the Bucks motion Godwin to the other side of the formation. While motion can do a multitude of different things for an offense, in this instance, it seems to do the tried and true thing of helping identify that the Texans are in man coverage as Godwin's defender follows him and the safety drops down. On the opposite side of the formation, Tampa runs a sort of dagger concept where Palmer's deep route will clear space for Evans to cut into. Both Evans and Palmer are going to be open here, but Baker never really looks their way. This might just be the way the play was drawn up, but I think Mayfield's got to recognize this and be ready to give this to his best receiver. The pre-snap tell, along with the safety sprinting to the opposite side of the field post-snap should be enough, I believe, for him to trust Evans will be available here. Next year with Cohen, I think we see Baker make it more of a point to force the issue. If Cohen can use motion to not only scheme up open space for his receivers, but also to help his quarterback read defenses more easily and make quicker decisions, this Tampa Bay passing game could be tough to stop. Baker will also need to improve in a few areas himself to lead this Tampa team to greater heights. His feet have always been funky throughout his career, and while his quick decision making and willingness to let it rip immediately are positives, it seems his upper half occasionally moves faster than his lower half. Here's a good play he makes against cover 1 versus the Lions, but check out his body position while throwing this and where the ball ends up going. I talk about setting hallways on this channel, where the QB's hips should align with where the ball is going, and Mayfield often sets his to parallel with the sidelines or pointed towards where his guy is, rather than where he will be. While he gets it there, there's a version of this ball that leads Evans and makes this a far less dangerous catch. But it doesn't always work out for the best. Against the Saints in Week 17, Baker tries to hit an out route but gets intercepted. He gets the ball out quick, but his feet don't get perpendicular enough to the sidelines to really lead his guy to open space. Instead, he's throwing it to where his guy is right now, and the ball hangs inside for the defender to make an easy play on. The other big knock on Baker is that he has a tendency to stare down where he wants to go with the ball, or at least spend too long analyzing one side of the field. You can see this in his batted pass numbers. He's always had a lot of them, and this past season, tied with Sam Howell for the most in the league with 17 batted balls. Yes, it's true, Mayfield is slightly smaller than your average quarterback, but batted balls are more often a symptom of telegraphing the general area you're going with the ball, and defensive linemen bailing on the sack and timing a jump with your throw, rather than just you being slightly smaller. On the good side of things, I was fairly impressed by his mobility and pocket presence. It was just not something I connected with him. There are definitely times where you can see him do a sort of DDR combo with his feet when he hangs in the pocket for longer than he likes, but there's also a lot of instances where he's pretty savvy in these moments. Even just these small maneuvers to step up in the pocket and evade the pass rush are huge, 
Here, it gives him both extra time and a little extra power to rip this ball to Palmer on a third and 23 to keep the game alive. But the thing that can make Baker deadly, especially with a good collection of receivers, is just how early he'll anticipate his passes. I found him to be most comfortable in the seams of the field, like on this play where Mayfield fits a ball to Godwin in front of the cover 2 coverage and before the middle linebacker can jump it for a nice gain. This is really only open for a split second, and Baker times it perfectly. Or on this play where Mayfield steps up in the pocket to avoid the pass rush, and then delivers a ball right as Evans is making his move to separate from the corner on him. Again, the anticipation Baker throws with here helps make this pass even more open, as he can get it there before Evans starts drifting closer to the middle safety. These types of plays get me really excited for what's to come for Baker next year. Getting another year comfortable in the system, along with a contract to give him more security, should all help him play this free, gunslinging style of quarterback that he's been successful at. There's always been a part of me that's been charmed by Baker Mayfield. His love of the game and genuine excitement to be out there competing is infectious. I'm happy he's finding success in Tampa Bay because I think Baker makes the NFL more fun. He gets a couple of extra yards. He went up the okay, floor. Baker. That's the Baker Mayfield we know. <laughs> but it goes beyond just his personality. I came away from diving into his 2023 season surprised by how impressed I was by a lot of his game. There are aspects of him that are limited, for sure, like how I'm not sure he'll ever truly fix his footwork, but when he's playing with confidence and gets into a rhythm, he can look like a top 5 guy out there for 2 or 3 plays in a row. If the Bucks improve their running game, and if Cohen updates the Tampa offense to create more opportunities for Baker to show off his throwing power and sense of anticipation, he could finally find sustained success. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please remember to give it a like if you did enjoy it, and please consider subscribing to the channel so you can catch the next one. Thanks. Bye.